It's very interesting when Mr. Neil and I stand side by side. <laughs> and I see him when he stands up, the podium is just like in his waist. I could barely be seen behind his podium. And you know, one thing that, uh, that reminded me of, is just like, he has a different perspective. He has a higher perspective. And I'm, I'm wondering what's the view from up there. And one thing that reminded me is, if Mr. Neil 6'9 has a different perspective, how much more God is. Amen? It's like God has had a drone shot, a drone view. Us is just like this. He says the beautiful things that we could not see. And it's somehow, it's worth trusting him. Amen? Amen. Can we learn that song again? Because that song reminds me of that uh, of that, uh, what's this, of that verse, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Isaiah 55, verses eight and nine. Okay. For my thoughts, sing. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my way, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know what, there's a second stanza. The second stanza is the verse that we used last night, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you unexpected end. And then back to, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Let's try the Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you unexpected end. Okay. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Amen? Amen? So whenever you are worried, whenever you're afraid, whenever things doesn't seem to make sense, remember that verse. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> Neither are your ways my ways. Let us kneel down for a prayer. Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for another day. And we praise and we thank you that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And your ways are way higher than our ways. And Lord, we praise and we thank you that every time we kneel down, we know where our place is. And you know that you are God. You know that you are the one in charge. And thank you, Lord, for reminding us to be still and know that you are God. Dear Father, I pray that uh, today may you prepare our hearts for what you're about to do to us today. May you open our hearts that you may be able to, to speak to us. And Lord, I pray that you please give us the heart that would be willing to receive you. Please anoint us, dear Father, with the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Again, dear Lord, hide me behind the shadow of your cross. Please move me out of the way that Jesus and Jesus alone be seen, be heard, be lifted up and exalted. This is our prayer, dear Father. And this is our desire, that we lift you up higher than we have lifted you up before. For we ask this in the loving name of your son, Jesus, all your children say, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, please open it in John chapter 15. What's the book? John chapter 15. If you're there, say Amen. If you're not there, say have mercy. have mercy. Okay. So John 15. John 15, and let's start with verse 4 to verse 7. What does it say? Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear, bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, is the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abided, abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Seven, if ye abide in me, and in my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. What's the verse, uh, what's the word here that has been repeated? Abide. abide. Without looking at your Bible. <laughs> Without looking at your Bible, how many times was it repeated? Ten? Ten? Seven. Seven. Okay. Nice guess. Seven. <laughs> and friends, when you look at the, the Bible, when the word is repeated two times, what does it mean? It's important. When it's repeated three times, what does it mean? Very important. When it's repeated seven times, perfectly important. Amen? It's perfectly important. It's really, 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 really important. And friends, who among you here has, has watched this? Has a blue, red letter Bible? What's, what is the color of that uh, series of verses? Huh? Red. What does that mean when it's written in red? Jesus said it. Friends, look at this. Seven times was it repeated and it's red. What does that mean now? It's very, very important. Jesus himself brought those words seven times in just four verses. In just four verses, seven times was it repeated. It means to say that Jesus is trying to get your attention here. It's like you are warning somebody, hey, do not go to the edge of the pool. Hey, do not go to the edge of the pool. Hey, do not go to the edge of the pool. But it's just imagine if it's repeated seven times. That should get your attention. And this, this words right now should get our attention. So I was, I was trying to, I was trying to, to look at the word abide and it says here, from the definition, from the definition, okay. Listen, it says to remain as one. This is abide. All the while I thought that abide is just like hanging out. <laughs> Did you get this? I say, I will abide with you as we go back home. Let's, let's walk together. All the while I thought that that's abide. Okay, when you reach home, bye-bye, I'll go to my home as well. But it says here to remain as one. And the next line was to be held or to be kept continually. Whoa. To be held and to be kept continually. Friends, who's holding who? Who? God is what? Holding us and continually. Did you get this? And this is one thing I, I realized, friends, oh, before anything else, I'd like to ask this question. Who among you here has seen couple holding hands? Well, of course, the single people, you get jealous, don't you? <laughs> and especially when they hold hands, even when they eat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you seen people holding hands while they eat? The other one has to compromise, use the left hand. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, give me a break. <laughs> looks so cheesy, isn't it? Sometimes it's irritating, especially for single people like us. <laughs> I heard a loud yes there. <laughs> it's, but this is the thing, friends. This is a relationship that God wants to have with us. He wants to hold us continually. Isn't this amazing? Even when you eat. But this is one thing I realized. I realized before that every time I do something, Every time I have, I have my devotions, when I'm done with my devotions, I leave God there. And I go to my, I go to my work, I go to, to school with God, not with me. And as a reason, 
I don't really reflect what He wants me to reflect because He's not with me. Friends, this is the abiding that God wants us to have here, to be held, to be kept continually. And I like the commentary in, Desire, in, in, in the Spirit of Prophecy that says, He holds, we are held continually. And I remember this, this beautiful verse in, in Romans, neither height nor depth, or any other creature, principalities could ever separate us from the love of God. And it says there in the commentary, it's not because we hold, he, we hold him so, we hold him so tight, but it, because he holds us so fast. It's his grip that's not letting us go. Isn't that beautiful? And friends, a beautiful thought here from Desire of Ages. One of my favorite chapters in Desire of Ages this is one of the longest chapters. It's a chapter entitled, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. And this is where it was talking about this, this, uh, this passage, the abiding. And it says here, this is the definition of abide. This is no casual touch, no on and off connection. The branch becomes part of the living vine. Whoa. The branch becomes part of the living vine. Who's the vine again? Jesus. Just imagine the branch becomes part of the living vine. Whatever flows through the vine will flow through you. Whatever the power that flows through the vine flows to you. This is why Jesus has been repeating this this word seven times again and again and again. But most of the time, we don't abide because we think that we have power of our own. <laughs> That's why the theme of this week is what? Absolute reliance. Absolute reliance. Now we have to find out. There is three reasons here that I, that I highlighted, three reasons why the Lord desires us to abide with Him. The first reason is that, listen to this, the life of the vine becomes the life of the branch. So the soul dead in trespasses and sins receives life of the connection with Christ. Listen, friends. The sinner unites his weakness to Christ's strength. Isn't that beautiful? Who among you here is weak? Please raise your hand. Okay, those who are not weak, get out. No, no. <laughs> you don't need this message. All of us are weak. We all have weaknesses. Amen? Just imagine this, because of abiding, your weakness is united to Christ's strength. Next one, his emptiness to Christ's fullness. Oof. Who among you here felt emptiness at one point or another, or even now? Friends, just imagine that emptiness will not be filled by fame, will not be filled by wealth, will not be filled by relationships, it will only be filled by abiding with Christ. And the frailty to Christ's enduring might. And then he has the mind of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? The first reason that Christ wants us to abide with him is that he wants you to have whatever he has. <laughs> Isn't this powerful? He wants you to have whatever he has. All the while I thought, friends, that, that God, before while I was in your age, that God is like an egocentric God, that He desires our worship. I said, why do you desire our worship? Why should we start our prayer with praising you and thanking you? You already know. Why do you have to hear it? And then I begin to realize, friends, that worship is not for the benefit of God. It's for our benefit. Can you say amen? amen. I love this beautiful thought here from Christ subject lesson it says when we submit ourselves to Christ the heart is united with his heart the will is merged in his will the mind becomes one with his mind and the thoughts are brought into captivity with him and then we live his life this is the reason why it's difficult for us to live like a Christian because we are not abiding when we abide it will come naturally Amen. it will not be forced it will not be forced, my dear friends. And this one really <laughs> blew me out of the ball game. <laughs> All who consecrate, what you say, what do you mean when you say consecrate? Surrender. You surrender. It was set apart. 
it was dedicated. And remember this, the thought that, uh, another, another thought from the spirit of prophecy that says, consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Yes. Huh? Make this your very, very first work. Let your prayer be. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. Let all my work be wrought upon thee. Remember that? Why do we have to consecrate ourselves to God in the morning? Listen, all who consecrate body, soul, and spirit to God's service will be constantly receiving what? How type of receiving? Constantly. You know what constant means? Never ending. Never stops. And I, I don't know about you, but I got confused with this illustration that peace like a river. I'm thinking the river is not so peaceful. It's like peace should be a lake. And then I begin to realize it is talking about the constancy. The river is ever flowing. That is the peace that God wants us to have. But this is the thing as well. It says here, we'll be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical, mental, and spiritual power. Did you get this? And this is one thing I realized. All the while I thought that spending time with God, consecrating yourself to God, will just be beneficial for your spiritual strength. I did not know that it would give you physical, mental, and spiritual power. Isn't God amazing? And listen, Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit. Oh, the inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. <laughs> Unlimited, friends. Inexhaustible supplies. We have a stock room that will never be exhausted, that will never be empty. I remember we had, we had a food shop back home and they, they offer unlimited rice. Just imagine how joyful it is for Filipinos to have unlimited rice. Unlimited rice, but sometimes they ran out of rice. <laughs> it says it's unlimited, but they ran out. Friends, God's supplies never ran out. God's supplies in, inexhaustible. Listen, Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. And this is mind-blowing. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energy to work in the heart and in the mind. It's not just an energy. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energy to work in the heart and in the mind. Friends, this is the reason why the Lord desires for us to consecrate ourselves to Him, to abide with Him. And this, this, this beautiful thought from Christ of the lesson as well, it says, as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, my definition here, as the will of man abides with the will of God, it becomes what? Invincible. Omnipotent or invincible. It becomes omnipotent. And English is not my first language, so I looked up what's the meaning of omnipotent. Omnipotent, almighty, possessing all power. Whew. Possessing all power. The reason that God wants us to abide with Him is because He desires to impart power to us. So stop running away. Stop playing hard to get. You'll not find power on your own. And you'll not find power in the world. You'll not find power in relationships, in wealth, in fame. You cannot find it. You could only find it in abiding in Him. Amen? Amen. Don't make your own mistake. Look back in the past. Read this and check it out. They would not have power unless they come to the Lord. Amen? Amen? Friends, gospel is so simple. If a child could not understand it, it's not a gospel. <laughs> a gospel is very simple. Abide, connect, power. Without, no power. <laughs> no life. No life. Listen to this, friends. Oh, Number two. The reason why Christ wants us to abide with him. It says, the life of the vine will be manifest in the fragrant fruit on the branches. 
He that abideth in me, said Jesus, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. The Lord wants us to abide in him because he wants us to bear fruit. Amen? There was one time that our church was talking about the fruits of the Spirit, focusing so much on, on the fruits of the Spirit, on the fruit of the Spirit. And friends, we're talking so much about the fruit of the Spirit, but the only way to have the fruit of the Spirit is to abide. <laughs> Amen? We should be talking more about abiding. The fruit will just be the result of the abiding. And it says, you'll bear much what? Fruit. The description in Desire of Ages, not just much fruit, much what? Fragrant fruit. Friends, what does fragrant fruit do to you? Oh, you get hungry. When you walk in a supermarket and then it destroys your walk. <laughs> you, have, you have one thing in mind that you want to buy and then you walk, mm, where's that durian? <laughs> I could see Mrs. Clark's face like. <laughs> For those of you who do not like durian, it's just like you run away. <laughs> For those who love durian, it's like, oh, where is that? <laughs> it's amazing how a fruit will take away your attention. This is one thing, friends, that God wants us to experience. The moment we bear fruit, the moment we bear fragrant fruit, it stops people on their, on their work, on their journey, on their pace. And they will notice that. I want to have that. <laughs> and that's the time. Friends, you do not have to look for divine appointment. The divine appointment will be at your door. Amen. The divine appointment will be at your face. Because they could not resist. They would not be able to resist. But this is the problem with us. We think that we can do it on our own. We, we try to grow our own fruits. And then the fruit that will come out, it's so little. <laughs> it's not even a fruit. It doesn't even ripen. You know why? Because we don't abide. I brought this flower here, not because I'm courting someone. <laughs> I'd like to ask this question. I'm sorry if you have rules here of not picking flowers. I just destroyed it. <laughs> I'd just like to ask this question. Who among you here thinks that this thing is alive? Raise your hand. There's only two choices, alive or dead. So says, who says, alive, please raise your hand. There's one brave soul. There's one not so brave. <laughs> Who says alive? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, now there's... Who says it's dead? Okay, well, it's almost divided. Don't worry, both of you are correct. <laughs> Friends, it's alive. It has the features of being alive. It's green. It's still bright pink but it's beginning to die. Did you get this? It's beginning to die. And sometimes, friends, we're like this. We look alive. But the moment we do not abide, we begin to die. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes we appear, and sometimes we color the flowers. <laughs> we color the leaves. We want to look alive, but deep inside, we're dying. If you do not abide, you'll be dying. A simple, simple logic. When you do not abide, you'll die. And this is the thing as well. If you keep on detaching yourself from the vine, the flower does not turn into fruit. And that's what's happening to us. We're not bearing fruit because the moment we see, oh, I have so many leaves now, time to detach. Oh, look at the flowers. I'm already budding. <laughs> Time to detach. We get too confident of the little accomplishments that we see in ourselves. That, okay, Lord, it's time to detach. And as a result, no fruit is being produced. This is the reason why, my dear friends, that the Lord wants us to abide with Him. Because He wants us to bear much fruit. And the moment you bear fruit, the moment people see the fruit, They'll receive the joy that they have been looking for. And you know what, what gives that to you? Joy. 
It gives you so much joy. And the more you bear fruit, the more you have joy. This is going to be like a snowball of joy. And the snowball begins to go bigger and bigger. It's going to be an avalanche of joy. This is one thing that the Lord desires for you to have. And just imagine if you experience that you cannot keep it to yourself. People will see it. People will see it. There's one story that I'd like to share with you. There's one lady in the sermon of Pastor Mark Finley. It's, it's a long time sermon, but I want to bring it up. There was this lady in Mongolia. You know Mongolia, they are, they are quite, quite, uh, quite strict when it comes to sharing the gospel. And in this time, especially during these years, that they were so tight. Mongolia is very, very closed up. I don't know, maybe right now they're still closed. There was this one lady who, who desires to share the gospel with, with her neighbors and friends. She could not keep it to herself. When you found out about something that's really good, really delicious, I don't know, maybe it's just a Filipino thing, but we cannot keep it to ourselves. We want to share it. So this lady shared it with her neighbors. And then every Sabbath, they're now having a meeting in her house and it's illegal to meet. They are beginning to have a house church. So the group begin to grow into 20. The next week, 30. <laughs> the next week, 40. The next week, 50. And it grew until 60. That her house, her house is not that big. And they have to take away all the furniture and put it outside <laughs> so that people could fit. So now there are some neighbors who are quite curious and quite angry of what she's doing. They reported it to the police and the police appeared on that time that there's a lot of people was in the house. And he said, if you keep on doing this, we will put you to jail. And a lot of people were afraid. So the next, the next was this, the next Sabbath, only 20 showed up. And sure enough, the police was faithful to, to their warning, they came. They arrested the woman, put her in jail, and sentenced her for one year imprisonment. But friends, when you're bearing fruit, they could not take away the fragrant fruit, especially when it's fragrant. And while she was in the jail, she kept on talking. And the next people in the next cell gave their hearts to the Lord. <laughs> and she was teaching them songs. And the next people in the next cell gave their hearts to the Lord. And then the jail personnel noticed what is happening. So at the end of six months, she was released. And she said, what are you doing? This is the lady who's complaining. What are you doing? I said, what do you mean what you're doing? We're releasing you. I said, no, my, my sentence is not over. Yeah, I'm only six months here. She's the one complaining she's being released. And the warden said, no, you're more dangerous being kept here. Because if we keep you here longer, you'll convert the whole prison. <laughs> Friends, that's what happens when you bear fruit. Amen. Amen? Your fear of sharing Christ to other people will disappear. Amen. Because your excitement to share, your desire to share will overwhelm, overwhelm your fear. Friends, you know what's my biggest fear before? Is to share Christ, in, especially in front of people. Seriously. I'm a sanguine, you see me, I'm like a pure sanguine. Half sanguine, half penguin. <laughs> I'm sanguine, but that's my greatest fear to share Christ. You know what? All the things I shared before was foolishness. All the things, I'm the life of the party. It's all foolishness. I'm known for, I'm known for crazy gem and all. And my greatest fear was, wow, people will see me as a holy gem. No, I don't want that. A faithful gem that will, that will destroy my reputation. I'm thinking, what reputation is that? <laughs> and then, friends, you know what? The moment you have Christ in you, you don't care about your reputation. Amen. You don't care about your image. Amen. What you care about is just sharing what you have. Amen. It will come out naturally. Amen? Amen? That's why Christ wants us to bear fruit. Not just sim simple fruit but fragrant fruit, that's what he desired. Last, okay, praise God it's last, huh? <laughs> number three, number three, listen to this, he says, 
The life that you have received from me can be preserved only by continual communion. Without me, you cannot overcome one sin or resist one temptation. First, what is the number one reason why the Lord desires that we abide in Him? He wants us to have power. He wants us to what? To have what He has. He desires to impart what He has to us. He wants us to have power. Number two, He wants us to what? To bear what type of fruit? Fragrant fruit. And the third, listen, listen to this. This blew my mind. Desire of Ages, page 679, paragraph 2. He knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like this. A series of uninterrupted victories. Can you say amen? amen. This is what the Lord desires for his people to experience a series of uninterrupted victories. Isn't that powerful? A series of uninterrupted victories, my dear friends. Who among you here is tired of being defeated again and again? Friends, that's not what God designed. What God designed was uninterrupted victories. And that's the only the result when we abide with him and listen though apparent impossibilities obstruct their way by his grace they are to go forward instead of deploring difficulties they are to be they are called upon to surmount them they are to despair at nothing and hope for everything with golden chain of his matchless love christ has bound them to the throne of god it is his purpose that the highest influence in the universe emanating from the source of all power shall be theirs. Amen? And last line, they are to have power to resist evil, power that neither earth nor death nor hell can master, power that will enable them to overcome as Christ overcame. Friends, this is the life that Christ wants us to have. This is the reason why seven times he repeated that word abide in just four in just four verses. Friends, if this does not get our attention, I don't know what will. I, if this, this is the whole solution that God is offering to us. What are we going to do about it? And it's funny because we were talking about, was it last night or maybe this morning? I oh, know, I think yesterday. While we're sitting at a table, we're talking about how ungrateful we are that we receive God's gifts and not thank Him. And then, you know what? I told them, you know what's the worst thing? I said, what's the worst thing? We don't even receive the gifts. We just turn around without even what? Without receiving it. Christ is giving us so much and do, what do we do? So, hello. Okay. I thought I destroyed it. <laughs> Friends, this is the thing that, that's happening. God is offering us all the powers of heaven at our command. But we are closing our hands. We're thinking, Lord, I don't want to abide. Lord, I don't want to connect. The Lord desires that each one of us would receive whatever he has. The victory that he has experienced, he wants you to experience. If we don't pay attention with what he's offering, I don't know what will bring us to the pit that we are in. Friends, we need him. Absolute reliance is the only way. Abiding is a joyful thing. <laughs> Amen? Listen to this thought. When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. A change is wrought that man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress. Again, I look, I look up what fortress means, a military stronghold. 
Who's fortress? God's fortress. A soul that is yielded to Christ will become his own fortress. God's own fortress, your soul. Listen to the next line. And he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Invincible, my dear friends. This is what he desires for us to have. Who among you here has heard about the author Oswald Chambers? My utmost for his highest. One of his devotionals that I really like is this thought. A life, a saint's life, is in the hands of God, is like a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. Who is the archer? God. What are we? Bow and arrow. And listen, God is aiming at something the saint cannot see. And he stretches and strains. And every now and again, the saint says or complains, I cannot do it anymore. But God, by his grace, he does not heed that prayer. He goes on stretching till his purpose is in sight. And then he lets fly. Isn't this beautiful? <laughs> Sometimes like, Lord, it's too much. I've been stretched beyond my stretchiness. <laughs> but the Lord sometimes does not heed. He kept, on, he kept on stretching until his purpose is in sight. And then he lets fly. Friends, what do you call a bow and arrow that's not being stretched? A decor. Huh? Yeah. When it's being stretched? Decor. Yeah, a decoration. When it's being stretched, it means to say it's being used. Amen. Amen? And when you are being stretched, my dear friends, it means to say that the target is inside. So stop moving. You don't know where you're going, but he does. Amen. You don't know what's the aim, what's the target, but he does. So as a bow that we don't know, all we have to be, all we have to be reminded of, be still and know that I am the archer. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Be still and know that I am God. Listen to this. You cannot see him just now. You cannot understand what he's doing, but you know him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee. John 17, verse three. And this is the real meaning of life. A life that can face anything it has to face without wavering. If we take this view, life becomes one great romance. Whoa, did you get this? Who says that single people does not have any romantic life? If you take this view, life becomes one great romance. Amen, single people. Amen. Okay, and listen to this. Life becomes one great romance, a glorious opportunity for seeing marvelous things all the time. Ooh, this is what a life in the hands of God looks like. Yes, you'll face trials. I'm not saying you'll not face trials, but friends, even in the midst of trials, you'll see marvelous things all the time. And listen, God is disciplining us to get us into the central place of power. That is in the place of his abiding. Amen? And why do you think God is desiring us to have this? If you jump to verse 11, if you're still there in your Bible, John 15, verse 11, these things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Amen? Amen? God desires for his people is not to take out what gives you happiness. God desires for his people is to receive, for us to receive his joy. Amen. For his joy that is so full. But most of the time, because of our stubborn hearts, 
because of our selfishness, we don't receive that joy because we don't want to let go. We don't want to give in. If you want to receive that joy, abide in Him. And guess what, friends? We could not abide unless we let go of the things that we so desire. I remember why I don't have a close walk with the Lord before. I remember that why I don't have a powerful devotion in life is because I was hanging on to something. Some of you knew I shared with you during lunch or some during counseling that I was addicted to, I was addicted to movies. <laughs> I had a collection of DVDs of more than 1,500 DVDs. Of course, all of them are pirated. <laughs> so it's double murder. <laughs> so friends, all the while I thought that I could not live without, without this. I have been so used to, to living my life watching all this and that's, that kept me so joyful. <laughs> all the while I thought that's joy, that's not. <laughs> it was fun. But the end of the day, friends, for those of you who, who could relate to, to my addiction, don't raise your hand, but at the end of your favorite movie, were you really satisfied? No. At the end of your favorite trilogy, are you satisfied? No. I'm thinking, oh, I wish there's another ending. And the producer produced another ending. Oh, there's another one. Well, it's really bad. <laughs> it does not give satisfaction. Even your favorite series, friends, series and all, all genre, I have it. It does not give you satisfaction. Only God can. And unless you let go of that, my dear friends, you'll not be able to abide. And you know what, what happened afterwards when we let go? It's funny because you know what? We had this youth conference and I'm, I'm the president of that youth conference. <laughs> and there was this speaker who spoke about wonderful experiences, faith experiences, and he talked about all these things and then he gave an appeal in the end. He said, if you want to be in Christ, in Christ, on Christ's side, you have to let go of the world. You could not be on both worlds. That's the worst torture of all. One foot in the world, one foot with God. He said, if you want to choose the world, choose the world 100%. If you want to choose Christ, choose Christ 100%. And he said, I assure you, if you choose the world, you'll never find happiness because joy is only found in the presence of God. So friends, I came forward and I came forward and I was crying. You know why? Because I'm thinking, I have never, I have not watched 300 of those DVDs that I bought yet. <laughs> Friends, and I'm thinking, what's life gonna be after DVDs? But you know what happened? Life just began. <laughs> life just began. All the while I thought that I was enjoying my life by spending so much time in those things that takes away my attention from the Lord. But actually, it stopped me from seeing the real meaning of life. The moment I let go of that, my desire to read the Bible began to grow. My desire to read the spirit of prophecy, and I'm thinking, spirit of prophecy, that's so boring, man. My mother tells me, read the desire of ages instead of watching TV, that was before. <laughs> and I read the desire of ages and my desire to sleep came over me. <laughs> And next morning, I said, it's morning. <laughs> this is a good sleeping pill. <laughs> and friends, you know what? The moment I let go of those things, the Lord opened my eyes and I saw the beauty of it. My favorite book is Desire of Ages. And I highlighted it. I, I have only one highlighter color before. And I, I was highlighting. I said, oh, what is this? It's the whole page that I highlighted already. <laughs> And I'm thinking, how can, I, how can I highlight the most important things and the important things? And I begin highlighting vertically on the side. <laughs> this is what happens, friends. And I was, I was reading the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer while they fought the Philistines. Only two of them fighting the whole army with armies, with footmen, numberless as the sand of the seashore. Only two of them. And they were trying to shut an arrow against Jonathan and his armor bearer. And it says there, in that spirit of prophecy, it says, but the arrows and the bows could not reach them because the angel of the Lord was shielding them. Friends, that did not happen in Lord of the Rings. 
They have to wait for armies to come. But their real story, not fiction, Amen. is greater than fiction. Amen. Way, way greater than fiction. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, I've wasted time, money, resources, and brain cells watching all those things. That's not even real. Friends, I tell you, real things are even mind-blowing than fiction. Amen. Spend more time. I, do not, I did not even realize that, prof, that patriarchs and prophets would give me so much excitement. I did not realize, friends, that patriarchs and prophets would open my eyes and open my eyes. Whoa, what story is this? It's awesome. And friends, we will not be able to see a picture like that if we are not fully abiding with Christ. Set your eyes on him. The distraction that the enemy is throwing at you are things that will impede your happiness, are things that will impede your joy. Lastly, I'd like to, to bring this, this thought from Ministry of Healing. It blew my mind. The love which Christ diffuses through the whole body is a vitalizing power. Every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerves, it touches with healing. By it, the highest energies of the being aroused to activity. It frees the soul from guilt and sorrow, the anxiety and care that crush the life forces. With it comes serenity and composure. And last line, very interesting. It implants in the soul joy that nothing earthly can destroy. <laughs> wow. And not, and not yet over. Joy in the Holy Spirit, health-giving, life-giving joy. Friends, this is what the Lord desires for us to have. And by the way, when you abide with Him, when you begin to bear fruit, there's going to be pruning involved. Huh? Pruning means there's going to be sharp objects involved. There'd be cutting. It will be painful. But it's, it says there, you will be pruned so that more fruits will come out. Amen? Amen. You'll be pruned so that more fruits will come out. It's for the sake of your joy. Amen. And listen to this line. This really blew my mind. The pruning will cause pain. But remember, it is the Father who holds the knife. Amen. Friends, there's no reason for us not to abide. So I believe that God desires to impart what He desires to impart to us. Let us let Him. Let us spend just three minutes. Let's gather like three people together, a minimum of two, maximum of three. Let's ask the Lord to teach us how to abide in Him. And at the same time, let's ask the Lord what is it in our hearts that stops us from abiding in Him, that He may expose it to us, that we may experience that full and total abiding. Let's... Let's start with a song. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in.